I'm Wes Talon, and our focus is on stormwater. At the Focus Roundtable are Douglasville, Douglas County Water and Sewer Authority Executive Director, Gil Shearhouse, Communications Manager, Lindsay Sargent, and Deputy Director and Engineering Manager, Brian Keel. Thank you for joining me. Thanks for having us. Stormwater is rainfall, melting ice and snow. It soaks into the ground, runs off into little creeks and streams. Now I know it's rained a lot lately, but why are we, or why should we be talking about stormwater? Well, stormwater is important to everybody. It, a lot of people don't think about it, but it is extremely important to everybody. And like it or not, it's, it's in our front yards, it's in our backyards, it's on the streets down which we travel. It is, it is everywhere around us and is often the thing that nobody thinks about and nobody considers how we, how we deal with it from the good or the bad. You know, Gil, one of the, the funny things, I don't know if funny is the right word, but stormwater, it's, it's good and it's bad. We all need it, right? I mean, all of our lives depend on it. We wouldn't have a drinking water system without it. That's, you know, we're not making water here. We're catching the water that falls as stormwater. We all rely on it for our lives, us for our jobs, right? But too much of a good thing is a bad thing. And as much as our lives depend on it, it you know, in the absolute worst cases, it can kill you. Okay, all three of you are with Water and Sewer Authority. That's drinking water and sewage treatment. And you just said, our jobs depend on it. So what does the WSA have to do with stormwater? When I, I, uh, I came to work at WSA about five years ago now, when I interviewed for the position of stormwater engineer, I had the exact same question. I thought, why am I applying for a stormwater job at a water and sewer authority? And it was in the interviewing process I got the answer. Um, I guess it was 10, 11 years ago now. Um, up until then, the city and the county had their own stormwater programs. They manage them as requirements of federal and state permits. Um, that's, that's something that every locality, every municipality across the state of Georgia has to do. Um, about 10 or 11 years ago, I guess it was, we had the opportunity to um, enter into intergovernmental agreements with both entities and take over management of the stormwater program. You know, Brian, it actually goes back a little bit further than that with the advent of some pretty strict federal and state regulations that were coming in in the late 90s. The, some of the leaders in Douglas County actually got together and decided um, as, as a group, community, civic leaders, business leaders, um, looking forward in Douglas County's future of how we can best improve our our stance as a, as a regional force, how can, what are some of the things that need to be focused on? And what they realized was stormwater regulations are getting so strict, so stringent. There was a lot of new permits coming down from the federal government, government from the state that um, the chamber and that group of, of leaders came together, did what's called a Douglas Blueprint. And in 2001, actually had a formal recommendation that the Water and Sewer Authority um, take over and manage stormwater management with the city and the county and that's what started that process of negotiating and entering into those stormwater agreements with the city and the county and we entered into those agreements in 2002 with the city and 2003 with Douglas County and that started this process of developing our what we call a stormwater utility. And then that's how you got hired. That is how and, I got hired. Bringing you into all this. so. You, you mentioned something about federal regulations and permits. Are there actual stormwater permits? There are stormwater permits, but if I could back up a couple of decades, I, th up. I think there's some, some interesting history on the, the water and wastewater side that kind of got us to where we are today in stormwater because for, for decades nobody thought about stormwater and we call that non-point source discharges. That's water as it runs off the ground. The focus in decades past was all on point source discharges. It was on wastewater treatment plant discharges, whether they were industrial or municipal. And everybody that was alive back in the 70s can remember the Chattahoochee River, for instance, was polluted. And it was polluted mainly from municipal and industrial wastewater discharges. Well, federal regulations, the local lawmakers, environmental communities, and the industrial and municipal groups have cleaned up their point source discharges. The wastewater treatment plants are operating very efficiently, very effectively now. And so what happened is by the time the 90s rolled around, 
the source of pollution in our rivers and streams was becoming more of the non-point source, the stormwater side, not so much the, the point source or the wastewater discharges. So um, the regulators started to focus on that more now that that was kind of the, the new low-hanging fruit. And so they developed these new stormwater permits that we call a, a national Oh, I'm pollutant. sorry, Brian, you, you, you say the acronym. I'm not going <laughs> to remember National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System, or NPDES permits. That's right. And that's the permit that governs our, our stormwater utility, correct? It is. It is. We've got one that's dedicated just to a municipal stormwater system. Lucky us. <laughs> Lucky us. And um, there are a lot of requirements in that permit. There are those of us on WSA staff that spend the bulk of our time ensuring that our activities, our record keeping, our reporting to the state keeps us in compliance with that permit. Okay, you've got a permit, and, and you, you got me a little bit here on the point and the non-point. Understand the point is uh, an industrial wastewater or uh, municipal sewer system or something, and it, I, I like treating it going into a point. Point sources is pretty much where you have a pipe dumping into a stream. Okay. And if that's a pipe coming out of a wastewater plant, putting treated wastewater in there, or if that's a pipe coming out of a factory, putting nasty, black, deadly, methyl ethyl, whatever into the stream, you know, it's coming in at a single point. Non-point source would be pretty much anything else. Water that's just running over the ground, coming out of the woods where the bears and the bunnies are pooping in it and running off the parking lots where the ashtray, the cigarette butts and shopping bags and baby diapers are running across the parking lot and into the streams next door. Anything that doesn't come in at a single point or a single pipe. Okay, so how on earth when you've got bunny poop and you've got uh, cigarette butts and you've got all of these things that you just, how can you control what goes into the wonderful muddy Chattahoochee? It's not as easy as it sounds. So how, how y'all are now in charge of stormwater. Mm -hmm. how, how do you control, and you have permits obviously. Right. Educate me. So, one of the requirements of our permit is a very extensive inspection program. Um, we are required by this permit to physically inspect every single pipe, inlet, every single part of our stormwater system um, throughout the permit's term. If we see anything that looks like a, uh, a source of pollution entering streams, creeks, lakes, whatever, any kind of natural water body, we are required by law to trace that source try to find out where it's coming from and stop it. And, and, if, uh, and, and Brian, I was just going to interject something there because I think it's a fascinating figure. How many <clears throat> pipes and inlets and ponds do we have to inspect oh on an boy. annual basis? Well, the permit says we've got to do them all over five years. In our system, we've got probably between six and 7,000 storm pipes. That's, uh, it's about 250 miles of storm pipes. We've got about 4,500 storm inlets. Those are catch basins in the road, those are yard drains in people's front yards. I couldn't tell you how many ponds, but there are hundreds of them. Um, and you have to in inspect each of these once every five years. What are you inspecting for? Physical defects. Is there anything wrong with them? Do they need to be repaired? Do they need to be replaced? Are they so far damaged or deteriorated that they're, they're beyond their, their uh, service life? They just need to be replaced. Um, evidence that anything is going into these or coming out of these that should not be. Any pollutants, um, any pretty much anything other than clean stormwater should not be in the stormwater, the public stormwater system. And you know, in, in that light, you know, so, something else that's required in our permit, and, and both of you deal with it heavily during your, your day to day. Um, two things one, we require people to have uh, pollution prevention plans, um, some, some facilities required to have more stringent ones than others and that's to help keep the pollutants out of the stormwater so you know the the grocery stores parking lot is required to be cleaned at a certain certain interval and we, we also have to do public education and outreach and public involvement those are required in our permit so while while we like to do those things it's not just a like to do it's a we have to do those things and, and Lindsay why don't you hit on a couple of the points that we do from from the public education and involvement yeah. standpoint. We definitely love to be out in the community and we love interacting with our customers and you know we have to hit so many points for our uh, stormwater permit per year but beyond that you know your greatest asset in your community is having people that are educated about what's going on in there 
So the more we bring to the table and the more we're able to educate the community about stormwater, about uh, water pollution and about the prevention of it, the better off we are um, in the community as a whole. You know, we can't be on the ground and cover every single mile of Douglas County all the time. So what we're depending on is our customers and our community to help us out with that. When they are driving around every day, if they see people throwing leaves in their storm drain, if they see people discharging in an, uh, in an illegal way, throwing paint down their storm drain, dumping trash somewhere, we want to know about that. And that's kind of the benefit of reaching out to the community and saying, hey, this is what you know goes into our stormwater uh, program, this is what we expect from you guys, and this is what we need help with, and that benefits everybody. So, well, Lindsay, back up a minute. A minute ago, you said putting leaves in the storm drain. That's bad. That's leaves are they're natural. They they fall off of trees. They're organic. How can that be a pollutant? Why can't I put that in the storm drain? Well, you could, but think about once it goes into the storm drain, where is it going? It's going to hit local streams. This water that goes into a storm drain is not collected by us. It goes straight into uh, your local creek, your local river, you know, that basin that's down down the street from your house. And what's going to happen is all that debris is going to collect in uh, into the rivers and it, it's really bad for the wildlife. Um, it's going to break down and I believe it creates... Well, I, I didn't do very well in biology, so take this with a grain of salt, but I, I think the way it works is um, things like leaves, grass clippings, anything organic like that, um, once it gets in a stream or a creek, there are bacteria in that creek naturally that are going to eat that stuff. Which, you know, hey, cool, nothing wrong with that. The problem is, in so doing, those bacteria use up all the oxygen in the water. And so now you've got water with no oxygen in it. All the fishies and the crawdads and the critters that normally live in there, they can't, the stream can no longer support them. So it's, it's uh, actually an oxygen, oxygen deficient stream, which. And, um, and it kind of fills up the stream too. Well, and, and if you put enough in there, it will fill up the stream. Okay. That's if it will get to the streams to begin. <clears throat> we, we have a crew that they almost do nothing else in the fall and the winter but go out and clean our catch basins and our drop inlets with leaves and litter because they clog them up. And a lot of times those clogged inlets will, because they can't flow, they'll, they'll be a reason why the street may be flooding instead of the water going through there because people have dumped their, their, ditch, uh, their leaves and grass clippings in the ditches. and it all goes somewhere and if it can't get out we have to clean it out and, right. and that costs money. The WSA is an authority, okay, state charter authority, correct? That's correct. Okay, Lindsay, people dumping paint into a catch basin, mm -hmm. y'all have a police force? How can y'all enforce these types of things? You're an authority, not a government. Well, we do hope that anytime someone does you know, you're, you walk out into your backyard and you see that your creek that runs to the back is, it's a milky white and it's usually, you know, regular water color. You think, well, something's not right about that. You know, my stream is not usually this color. What's being put into it? Uh, we would heavily encourage anybody to give us a call. Give us a call and we can send one of our inspectors. We can send some of our engineers out there to investigate the problem. Um, and Lizzie, in addition to that, you know, the way we want to handle any problem is to preempt it, and the best way to do that was is public education, like like we're doing with this program. But beyond that, we do have some enforcement authority. Um, we are um, we have the ability to issue uh, administrative fines to violators. We can fine them. We can we can terminate their water service if it comes to that. Ooh. We have a team of inspectors that are sworn constables of the court in both the city of Douglasville and Douglas County they can drag you into court if that's what it comes to. But that's, we use that as a last resort, of course. That is not how we want right. to handle these issues. And in fact, the vast majority of the cases where we find somebody has dumped a gallon of paint into a storm drain, it's because they didn't know any better. Okay, let's, let's, let's <clears throat> take that point for a moment. We were talking about the leaves and everything else like that. Um, most of our stormwater here flows where? Into a creek. Uh, Anybody that's lived in Douglas yeah. County long knows we're we're blessed by an abundance of creeks and topography. So, um, okay, but and, and does all of our stuff go to the Chattahoochee. Eventually, all of it does. About a third of it goes into uh, the Dog River watershed. If you're in the western part of the county, that goes into the Dog River basin. About I'd say about half of it on the north and east goes into Sweetwater Creek, um, and the other part, the central part, goes into either Bear Creek or Anawakee Creek. 
Okay. And all of those creeks drain into the Chattahoochee River. Okay. And the water treatment plants are where? All of our water in Douglas County comes from primarily the Dog River uh, uh, Reservoir, which is in the Dog River Basin. So anything that's dumped into a creek or stream or in your backyard ditch, if you're in the Dog River area, goes into our water supply. And we have to get that pollutant out before we can send that water to somebody's house for consumption. Okay. So how do you do that? Well, primarily through education. We want our cus customers and consumers to be educated so they know what do you not do? What, what is okay to put down a storm drain? And, and the answer there is nothing but clean storm water. Um, anything okay, else so is, you, is you a You want pollutant. storm water, but you just don't want... We, we, we want water. Wes, if you'll remember back to third grade science, do you remember... Do you remember that? That was that was a long time for me. Um, I know I don't. Older than you are. My, my third grade science teacher won't believe that I actually remember this, but but I do. Um, water is water is water, and that that's one of our kind of mantras around the office, and that's one of the reasons we were brought into the stormwater um, field because the water that comes down the streams as stormwater, if it's carrying pollutants, if it's too much, not enough, that affects our water supply. So the water that we take out of the streams and lakes that we uh, treat and send to our, our residents as potable water depends on the quality and quantity of stormwater. And, and on the other end, once we have treated that water uh, to a very high degree, by the way, in our wastewater treatment plants, that same water goes right back into the streams for downstream use for recreation and consumption. For instance, the, um, the city of Columbus basically is using the water that, that we have discharged back into the river and then that water continues on down, evaporates into the sky, comes back to us as precipitation, stormwater runoff, and here we go right back over again. So we're pretty good that we're farther up on the flow of the river <laughs> than down at the... Two, two, two points there, Wes. One, yes, absolutely. You want to be, you want to be upstream of, of everybody that's dumping their wastewater plants. In there, and that's really one reason, one of the primary reasons why we do not use the Chattahoochee River for our water supply. There is an abundant supply of water in Douglas County, and that is the Chattahoochee River. But a lot of people don't know that the Chattahoochee River is at its worst condition at the Douglas County line. And that's because of all of the wastewater discharges from the city of Atlanta, Gwinnett County, DeKalb, and, and they're not doing anything wrong. They are treating their wastewater correctly, but it takes time for that water to what we call assimilate the wastewater until it's back to a healthy case. The, the dissolved oxygen Brian was talking about earlier is a good condition of stream health. The, the dissolved oxygen sag point is what they call it. The lowest point in the Chattahoochee River is actually at the Dog River's confluence with the Chattahoochee River. So we get all of our water from the Dog River upstream of the Chattahoochee River so that it's at its best, most pristine point while we, where, where we take it out. Where we take it treatment. out and then our treatment goes into the channel. So that's Correct. why really nobody's fishing off of the Fairburn Road bridge Th that's and correct they're going all the way down to west point lake because mm -hmm. by that point it's assimilated and that's correct we've already put our good stuff in there to help it out that's exactly right boy that sounds good <laughs> <laughs> that. it's the okay. same water the water it's, you're drinking is the same water that's been around that the the dinosaurs used okay now, <laughs> okay we're talking about storm water and all of the stuff in there i've noticed on my monthly bill from the Water and Sewer Authority, there is a stormwater fee. Now, when I turn on the faucet, water comes out. I understand that. I'm so many gallons, I'm paying for it. My, the water leaves the house, and I'm paying a sewage fee. I'm not using stormwater. It's coming down from the good Lord onto my roof and into the driveway and and on my grass and stuff like that. Why am I paying a stormwater fee? Well, let me, if you don't mind, Brian, let me, let me address first how we got to the point of charging a stormwater fee, what that fee trying is. To weasel out of this I'm trying question. to weasel out of the question, and tell. I'm going to let Brian and Lindsay oh, answer the question. <laughs> I just want to paint a little bit you. of historical perspective for us, and then I'll let them answer the actual he's a question. Major. He keeps going, I want to go back and explain all this stuff for 172 years from now. That's right. We, we want our, our consumers to be educated. Yes, third grade science teacher. That's, Here we go. Yes, that's right. by all means, let's um, go back. So, but it's, it's an important point to make because, like you said, we, we're the Water and Sewer Authority. Stormwater is not even in our name. When, when it was recommended that we deal with stormwater, 
because we don't get a drop of tax dollars. We, we're not a government, so we get zero tax dollars. We had to develop a funding mechanism to fund the management services that we're now called on to perform for the city and the county. So we had, we had a host of consultants come in and do studies. We evaluated the current stormwater systems, what its needs were, what the projected needs were, and, and that developed um, a, a series of projects and programs that we were going to need to do to meet our current local needs as well as these federally and state regulated permits that we've talked about already. Well, it costs money to manage those services and provide those programs including and projects, salary. including Brian's salary, including part of my salary and part of Lindsay's too. I mean, a lot of, a lot of our employees' time goes to stormwater amongst, amongst the other things we that, we, that we do. <laughs> that, that's, well, that's, that's right too, but that, that's a, maybe that's a different focus. Uh, that we, we can focus on that at, at another time. Um, so so what, we, what we realized was, you know, we had to have a certain level of funding for these programs and because we were a separate entity, we developed what's called a stormwater utility so we can do those programs aside and we developed a funding mechanism for that that we, we refer to as our stormwater utility fee and that, um, that study resulted in the need to charge each residential property a $4 fee per month. Um, we charge non-residential properties, apartment complexes, uh, churches, the mall, um, any other commercial business, a multiplier of that same $4 fee. So if you have um, you know, a, a commercial business that's the same size as 10 houses, you get $40 a month on your monthly water bill. Everybody pays the same. It's based on the amount of impervious surface on their property. And that, that $4 per month per house generates about $4.5 million for our program per year. And okay. that funds these projects and programs that now we can talk about you know, what we actually do with that. Okay, money. now what do we do with this, Brian? So Other than paying salaries. So we spend about half of it, maybe a little bit more than half of it every year, just maintaining the infrastructure that we have out there in the public right of way. All the pipes that run under the road, all the drains on the side of the road, all the ditches that run up and down the road. Gil mentioned a little while ago that we have guys that spend all day every day just cleaning these things out because they fill up with trash, debris, without cleaning them out they're going to fill up with water the road's going to flood you can't drive your car on the road anymore and we can't get emergency services and to we our can't get emergency services to those residents that need it so it is a vital integral part of maintaining the integrity of the public transportation system in douglas county one of the reasons in fact that that we feel the the four dollar fee across the board to all customers is justified is because everybody benefits from it equally anybody that uses the public roadway system in douglas county is benefiting from the service that we provide for that fee, the stormwater utility service. And we've got from day to day, two to three crews all day. That's all they do is go around and maintain the stormwater system, clean it out, inspect it, make repairs where necessary, identify the needs for replacements if, if it needs to be completely replaced. So a lot of that comes out of that four and a half million roughly a year. The other half of that we use to fund capital projects. Capital projects would be when one of our inspectors or one of our maintenance guys takes a look at a pipe and that thing is just so rusty or collapsed or cracked or whatever, it cannot be fixed, it needs to be replaced. So, And Brian, what happens if it <coughs> fails before we replace it? So if it fails before we replace it, usually you have an impassable road. The road collapses either you know, off the shoulder, sometimes right down the middle of the road. Um, worst case, you know, people, the traveling public are injured best case you have a road that you can't drive across for weeks at a time until it gets fixed. So that's that's the whole point of this program is identify and address these issues before the road system is compromised. Brian, you made a point that, that reminded me of a question that I get a lot. I'm sure you guys get this a lot too. I live on a large lot. I don't have a stormwater problem. I'm not contributing to the problem. Why do I need to pay that fee? And you mentioned these culverts on the road, and that's usually one of the, the answers that I give people as they as they ask me about the stormwater fee. Why am I paying this 
this fee, well, it's not necessarily to address stormwater on your property. It's more to address stormwater in the public road right-of-way. So, and I've actually done this for some of our customers that have called. I'll, I'll look up where they live, and I said, you know, where did you go today? And they'll say, well, I went to the mall, for instance, and they might live off um, Highway 166 and come up Chapel Hill Road. I have counted the number of culverts across which they drove on their way to the mall and said, those 18 culverts that you passed, that's what that $4 a month is going towards, is to you know, maintain, operate, and replace it when necessary, those culverts, so that you can get back and forth to the mall or to church or to business or to work safely and securely mm -hmm. every day. That's, that's what the $4 is going towards, is the, the work in the public road right of way. Okay. And Gil, you, you brought up what is you know, probably the most common question we get from customers. I pay my $4 a month, why won't you fix the storm pipe on my property? WSA policy is that we do not repair stormwater infrastructure on private policy, on private property, private excuse property. me. Mm -hmm. um, it, in the same way that we determined $4 a month is what is required to maintain the public system, we have also determined that we're, we're WSA to take on uh, maintenance responsibility for private property infrastructure. This is all the pipes and ditches that people have running across their private yards we would have to increase everybody's utility fee. And we're not talking about going from $4 to $5 or $6. We're talking about going to $20, maybe $30 a month to take on that responsibility. And at that point, we have to look at it from the standpoint of our rate payers. Is there, is there equity for everybody should we go to that point? If, uh, if Joe decides to buy a house at the bottom of the hill where all the water's going and Joe's got a pipe that goes through his yard and maybe that pipe has an issue with it, his buddies, John and Ed, bought houses that are not at the bottom of the hill. They don't have pipes in the yard. They don't have ditches in the yard. They don't have a stormwater issue on their property. Is it right to ask John and Ed to pay an extra 16 to $26 a month because, what did I say, Joe? I think Joe. Joe, yeah. I because, think because, because, Joe, <laughs> because Joe has a problem on his private property that he needs fixed. Is that fair? So Ron, you're, you're talking about value engineering and value judgment on, on things like that. But you, and, and I can understand you've, you've we, uh, we had roads built back here in 1870 that have some semblance of a pipe underneath and that are going to have to be addressed. But those types of things the public really can't help with. It, it seems like that, uh, you know, the first part of, part of our discussion was on the, the pollutants and what, what we can actually do with storm water and to storm water to keep this down to $4 on a residential piece of property because you were talking about cleaning out the culverts and even dredging the Dog River Reservoir if you need it, if it filled in too much. So each of you brought, it, all three of you, I, as I've been going through this, all three of you have brought up the word education. So it sounds like that there needs to be some, really, some stormwater stewardship. What should we be doing? I don't think the question is what should we be doing, is what are we doing, right? Is, well, what, what should the public be doing? I mean, is there anything we need to be doing to keep this at $4 a month and, you know, things like that? It sounds like the WSA's got their handle on most of this, but I, you know, what, are, what should our viewers be? What should our viewers take away from this? I really I'm think that, that one. <laughs> uh, being a good storm water steward is it's not a huge undertaking. It's not something that you need to dedicate, you know, this huge chunk of time to doing. It's it's a lot of small measures that you can do that really add up to a big benefit to, you know, our community. What's coming up soon? Pollen season. Yes. Now think about every day when you walk outside and your car is just absolutely covered in green dust and you think, I need to wash my car tonight. Well, instead of hosing it down on your driveway, think about this. Take it to a commercial car wash because what do commercial car washes do with their water? Clean your car so you don't have to do it. Besides that, <laughs> besides the obvious benefit of that, they're recycling that water. Right. Oh, so, they're treating it on site. So mm -hmm. instead of it going down the storm drain and being yellow, they're reusing it, they're you know, reusing it all day long. So system. it's really you get a, you get a good benefit from taking your car there environmentally instead of hosing it off in your driveway every other day. 
um, they're treating that water and they're using it over and over so they may get 50 uses out of it versus the one time you use it and then it goes down the drain. Okay. Which, and you think about that and that's, that's not a huge undertaking and it has benefit for us and for the community and for the health of uh, you know, our streams. You know, another thing you can do, you know, like we said, when you're doing your lawn care, when leaves are falling, you've got branches everywhere, it doesn't take very long to rake them up into a bag versus raking them into your ditch and hoping that a big storm comes and pushes them down into your neighbor's ditch and then you don't have to worry about it. And, and they then, can clean it and they can, yeah. you know, and passing the buck to somebody else. You know, take the extra five or 10 minutes to just bag them up, you know, set them out for the trash guys to come pick up. And it's little things like this that when you stack them all together, you get a, a great benefit from it. Wow. When we started this, I asked you, why should we ta be talking about stormwater? So I think there's a little bit more to it than <laughs> most people um, probably know about. So I Lindsay, think we would agree. Yeah, I don't Lindsay even think we scratched the surface yet. Yeah. <laughs> And gentlemen, thank you so far much for the information and for the discussion. Thanks for having us today. And thank you for watching. I hope that we brought some focus into this subject for you. I'm Wes Talley. See you next time.